you for the invitation to this uh, this conference. It's the first time I attend one of these uh, Network Frontier and and it's such a internet conference. So thank you for the invitation to all the organizing committee. So this uh, I'm going to talk about the interaction of averaging and symmetry for the study of coupled oscillators. Uh, this is joint work with uh, several people: Antonio Palacios, Bernard Chan, Jose Ray Ferreira, Stephen Reeves, Patrick Longini, uh, and Vitor Atin. Uh, and funding has been provided by uh, several sources, uh, NSER Canada, uh, in the U.S., ONR and DOD, in Brazil, CNPQ, and uh, also uh, the internal funding at SPAYWAR in San Diego. So what I want to talk about, the motivation for this, uh, I would say, theoretical work, is from a couple of networks of uh, crystal oscillators. So what we have here on the left is, is a quartz crystal model. Uh, so it's a quartz crystal. And the quartz crystal can be actually um, modeled by this equivalent circuit, this LRC circuit. And uh, it has a precise resonant frequency when it's subjected to some electric field. Whatever hap what happens, however, is that there is also a, a spurious frequency uh, that appears in, in, these, uh, in these quartz crystals, and they cannot be removed really nicely. So in the mathematical modeling here on the right, these equations actually come as coupled LRC circuits. Uh, so we see here the LRC, and, and but the coupling here comes on the right-hand side. So I uh, is uh, the uh, uh, the uh, intensity. And uh, what we do here is we looked at one of these uh, crystal oscillators, which is here I'm pointing here. It's just uh, this little circuit. And we are coupling them. In this, in this case, the picture shows a new unidirectional coupling, but we also looked at bidirectional coupling of these uh, crystal oscillators. So the governing equation, for instance, in the unidirectional coupling case is given here. So we have, uh, this is for uh, the crystal K and J is one or two because we model the two frequencies as you know, j equals 1, j equals 2. And then here are the coupling terms, and the lambda is the coupling parameter. So coupled, in this case, k plus 1 to k. And in dimensionless form, we have this expression down here. And what one may notice is that there's an epsilon in front here. So what we have here on the left is just a harmonic oscillator. So each uh, crystal oscillator we can look at and and write it as this harmonic oscillator, and on the right-hand side, there's a forcing term, so which actually introduces the, the weak coupling. The epsilon here is actually to the, of the order of 10 to the negative 5, and everything else is sort of order 1. So this is, in fact, really a, a weak coupling, and also a weak forcing at the same time. Uh, so the interesting thing here is that if epsilon is 0, what we have is each each node of our of our network is really just a harmonic oscillator. Uh, it's not just you know one oscillator, maybe that could be asymptotically stable. We actually have each node as being sort of a, a center. So th the idea is that when turning on the weak coupling, we cannot just assume that we're going to have just a unique torus where maybe we can go to phase oscillation uh, just to uh, study the phase uh, as phase oscillators. We don't have that luxury. So uh, let me talk about the objectives now of this, this study with these crystal oscillators, so they are able to produce stable oscillation with very good accuracy, and they're also the very low cost. But they have some phase drift, and the phase drift prevents them from being used for uh, some high precision systems, uh, timing systems. The idea here is that maybe by coupling them, uh, these crystal oscillators, uh, we may be able to reduce the phase drift in the oscillation and in order to do that, we decided to just study, you know, what kind of uh, patterns are being seen in these ring networks. So either unidirectional ring networks or bidirectional ring networks. So because we're going to be looking at oscillations at, big, at pretty core bits, uh, in principle, one can think of using a Hoff bifurcation theorem to find those. And because we're actually looking at these as being uh, identical uh, crystals with identical coupling will have some symmetry in the network. So for the unidirectional coupling, we'll have a cyclic symmetry, so given by the group Zn. So Z, uh, the 
capital N being the uh, the number of uh, uh, crystal oscillators, or for bidirectional coupling, we'll have the dn uh, group. Now, one thing uh, that people did when they studied just one crystal oscillator in Lorrain et al., they used averaging to decouple the two frequencies of the uh, of the one crystal oscillator, and so that actually enabled them to show that you know they had the right you know the the, the right periodic os uh, oscillation they were looking for, and in fact you know so they were connecting what they found in, in the equilibria of the of the average system to prove the periodic orbit of the full system. So I'm going to return to this fact in a mo in a moment. The idea is that when we go to the actual dynamical system equations, so written, written in here in matrix form, so we have x sub k, which is the k, the k uh, crystal oscillator, and in, in matrix form, we have this matrix A and the coupling matrix B, so the lambda is the coupling parameter and B is the, coupled mat the coupling matrix, uh, and N is some pretty complicated vector of nonlinear terms. If we want to use some symmetry techniques to reduce this system to a, a, a blood diagonal system via the isotopic decomposition, what happens is that the 4 by 4 blocks that we obtain, uh, if we're looking for the eigenvalues of those, they are extremely complicated and we, don't, we, we do not get nice uh, analytic expressions for those. And this is where we came back to the idea that Lorrain all used for one crystal oscillator. We thought that maybe we could use some kind of averaging technique to decouple the system. So let's say if you think of the first block over here, this is the uh, is one frequency, and the, the the lower block here is the second frequency. But we have these coupling terms here: a over l1, a over l2, and we have also coupling coming from from the B matrix. But it'd be nice to, if we could actually physically, you know, decouple those two frequencies. So this is what I'm going to this is what I'm going to talk about. So what we do is we use a Van der Poel transformation, and this Van der Poel transformation transform the governing equations to this system. So this is just for one crystal oscillator. So we have x sub k prime, and we see we have this epsilon here, which we know is pretty small. And so for x k, the dynamics is actually uh, some kind of slow dynamics because there's only the epsilon term times x one. And then for the, so these are the amplitudes and the phases phi sub k, the equation uh, have some fast frequency omega zero, and then with the also slow term here with epsilon omega one. So these omega zero, this omega zero is in fact composed of two frequencies, omega one, omega two. And what happens is that we have n oscillators and they all have the same two frequencies, omega one and omega two. Now we're going to write those, uh, the, the whole system as uh, just one big system here, down here with X and capital X and capital C. And we're going to have this, I'm going to call it the same thing, this omega zero vector, which is uh, just, I guess it should be a, not such a bold omega zero here. Uh, so this omega zero is just these, all these omega zero frequencies, which are given by omega one, omega two. And we rewrite it as follows down here. And now we have these two functions, H one and H two. So at this point, what I'm going to do is, turn to some kind of general setting. So that fun those functions H1 and H2 we're going to call H, and those will be gamma equivariant, where gamma is some subgroup of uh, S sub n. Now this gamma, uh, in our case, for the crystal oscillators, is either Zn or Dn, but in the general setting, it could be some other subgroup also. There's also some kind of symmetry that we're going to impose, and this symmetry is in fact present in the case of the crystal oscillators, and that's why we're, we're doing the setup in completely general form. So we have some even symmetry for the H1 equation, which is from the amplitude, so from minus, so H1 of X minus phi is H1 of X phi, and this odd symmetry for the H2, which is in uh, the phase equations. Then what we do is we're going to separate the fast and slow variables, so the phi will be replaced by phi plus phi sub s, where phi sub s is just the this fast variable here. And what happens then is that we decouple the slow dynamics in x and capital phi. 
So just given by epsilon H1, H2. And then the fast dynamic is just the last equation, PS dot, which is omega zero. Now, in this formulation, what we can do is use just a, a technique using diophantine uh, condition on the frequencies omega one and omega two. So if they satisfy such a diophantine condition, uh, then the slow system in X, in capital X and capital P, is equivalent to this gamma equivariant system in Y and beta, where the first term is the average uh, system, and then we have some remainder term H2. And so this H bar is actually, so as I said, you know, the average system. And the, the whole transformation is gamma equivariant and periodic in, in both entries. So what we're going to do now is focus on this average or what is often called the full average system in Y and beta. And let's look at the symmetries of that system. Well, the first thing to notice, uh, what we can do is, and is just remove the epsilon. And, and in, in, some, in some references, this is called the uh, guiding system. So we have Y dot is H1 bar and beta dot is H2 bar. And the average part is, in fact, if you actually compute the integral, you see that the HIs are, in fact, functions of the differences of the phases, so beta 1, 1, and minus beta 2, 1, and so on. So what we can do is actually in, induce, well, introduce an SO2 cross SO2 action on these phases, beta 1 and beta 2, as defined here, just adding eta 1 to all the, the betas with the second index 1 and adding eta 2 to all the phases, which are uh, beta 1, 2, so with the second index 2. So that means that this h bar, our average equation, is SO2 cross SO2 invariant. Then with the even odd symmetry of h, this implies uh, sym symmetry in the Fourier coefficients, which is, are listed here in blue. And then what we can do is actually write down, instead of just Right, keeping the betas, just to simplify, we look at the differences of the betas, and we define this as an alpha uh, phase, or difference of phases, and uh, so alpha is just alpha 1, alpha 2, and the alpha j's are just all these alpha 1j to alpha nj. And then we re when we write our system in terms of a free expansion, what we realize is that the average equation also has the same even and odd symmetry that I introduced before. And in fact, if we let kappa be some action on y and beta, given by, so fixing y but sending beta to minus beta, then the average equation is in fact z2 kappa, in fact it should be equivariant. What we can do now is search to, uh, to complex coordinates, and in complex coordinates the SO2 action becomes an, o2, an SO2 equivariant on the equation, and the uh, kappa action becomes complex conjugation. And what happens is that the complex version is now O2 cross O2 cross gamma equivariant, and the system actually decouples along the fixed points of spaces of fixed SO2. And in fact, for coupled crystal networks, these HI hat equations are really much simpler than the original equation. So what we have our first result, which says that if I take sigma a symmetry uh, an isotropy subgroup of gamma cross SO2, and if I have a non-singular steady state solution of just one of these decoupled equations, and that non-singular steady state solution has isotropy sigma, then the full system has a periodic solution with 2 power omega 1 symmetry. And what happens is that we don't have to worry about the kappa because uh, that acts diagonally, so we, the sigma is just important to look at subgroups of gamma cross SO2. And so what happens here is that the SO2 action on the phases becomes the S1 action on the predict solution. And so then we can use that correspondence between the predict, the equilibrium of the uh, average system with the full system to write this bifurcation result, which is sort of equivalent to the equivalent uh, branching, uh, the equivalent Hopf theorem. So if we have a one parameter family of guiding systems with some equilibrium solution, in fixed SO2 and fixed by O2 cross gamma. And if the kernel of this uh, linearization is a non-trivial absolutely reducible representation of O2 cross gamma, 
Then for each bifurcating branch of steady state of the guiding system, which is symmetry sigma, there's an equivalent, a corresponding bifurcating branch of predictive solutions with spatial temporal symmetry sigma for the full system. And so we did some numerical simulations, and uh, numerical simulations actually match spot on with what we were able to compute uh, with the guiding system. And uh, essentially, uh, so what we're looking to do now is maybe prove the same general result for more general coupled cell system, not necessarily with symmetry, and maybe even prove a completely general version of the occurrence Hopf theorem using that approach, following the work of the Lieber and collaborators uh, that I've done recently. So thank you.